So there I was, a graduate student at Berkeley, standing on a stage in Santa Barbara in front of most of the people openly working in the field of cryptography at the time, back in 82. And for doing this, I could have spent the rest of my life in jail. Just months prior to this, the National Security Agency, in fact, the head of the NSA, the new head, had written threatening letters to the IEEE and ACM and everyone saying, if you even have a session on cryptography, the federal government is going to throw the book at you. Even if you thought of it without in getting information from the government, it would still be classified. And th there was a lot of activity in those days where the government was putting secrecy orders on people doing research and stuff like that. An event that some have called Internet Woodstock. And that was in Geneva at CERN where the web was born. That's the was called the first World Wide Web Conference. And you know, since then it's it's been annual uh, every year. And uh, so there were two keynote speakers and I was the first one. And I got to make the first e-cash payment publicly, and it was from Geneva to Amsterdam, where my DigiCash company was, and I, I did it in sort of in front of everyone on the, the projected uh, uh, web page. In those days, it was all about the web, so the whole presentation was from a website and, and so forth, and, uh, and I demonstrated our software and everything, and then I went out on the patio and wrote a little press release, a few paragraphs about this, sent it back to this guy, Paul at, at our company, who was a kind of amateur PR guy. And within 48 hours, it was like all over global media. People were fascinated, excited by this idea that a number could be worth money. Just fast forward, I was standing, staring at the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel with only one or two other people in the chapel, and they happened to be central bankers. And the reason I found myself in this situation was because I'd been invited to give a, a presentation to the secret meeting of central bankers. They told me no other non-banker had ever been there, let alone give a presentation. You know, they closed off the, a number of avenues in Rome so that we could walk across all these streets and just walk into the Vatican uh, and have it all, all the museums and everything to ourselves. I don't think I would have found myself in the Sistine Chapel if I just kept publishing little articles about this in the technical literature. I think it was because I created the DigiGash company and made this uh, uh, this actual demonstration, and we had, you know, licensed Deutsche Bank and uh, major banks in Australia, and uh, we had U.S. Bank and so on issuing uh, fiat-denominated uh, e-cash, and then we had done an airdrop of our own currency, the Cyberbucks currency, and we would give you a hundred Cyberbucks if you would open a shop. And there's a bunch. You can go to charm.com and see the little e-cash museum there. Uh, you can see all the press releases and a bunch of the uh, companies that uh, had websites that were participating in the Cyberbucks and, and so forth. I remember eating top of these uh, stones in a part of a 10-course traditional over-the-top Korean uh, royal banquet uh, with a lot of the key people in the blockchain space. To be quite frank, uh, there were two things that really grabbed me there. One was, and I hate to have to say it, but the people who were leading the technology in the, you know, the, 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 the big names in blockchain 
that you all are familiar with. You know, I don't want to you know, disparage anyone, but I, it, it was clear to me that these people, because they were having meetings among themselves, and I was just an outsider, so I was just sitting in, you know. I, I could see that there was no way that they were going to deliver on the promise that, that they had uh, made, and that this whole, uh, it was uh, just shocking to me, really. And... Uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, I saw that, well, there is a community of people who are interested enough in these issues and appreciate the significance of them enough to really actually do stuff. So let me take you back to Berkeley, uh, 1980. I was sitting in a hot tub looking up at the redwood trees. And it was in uh, actually the backyard of one of my, my prof professor at the time, my PhD advisor. And um, it's the same one that uh, Bill Joy and Eric Schmidt had, Bob Fabry. And, you know, Bob was asking me like, well, you know, so how you, you know, I know you want to solve these privacy problems, David, but I mean, how are you going to do it? And I said, well, Bob, you know, what we'll do is we'll just take the simplest possible problem, a real, find a really simple toy example, work that out, and then we'll elaborate from there. Yeah, I said, well, maybe uh, voting. That's, everyone knows privacy is important in voting. Let's see. How can I cast a vote on a, on a computer network? Hmm. Oh, and that's when I came up with the Mix Network, which was my master's thesis and also appeared in CACM. A number can't be really worth money if it's possible that you could just record everything in a big centralized database. The only way to have a digital bearer instrument, a number that is itself worth money, is by using privacy technology. Uh, so, the, so the blind signatures, for instance, that I developed for this purpose, they kept anyone from knowing who had, you know, who had withdrawn a particular number that was clearly now worth money. And so there was no way to have a database that would record where these, who had these, these numbers or how much they had or to stop you from spending your money. In June of 2013, Edward Snowden's revelations came out and he asserted that the government had been tapping basically every internet communication, every communication on the planet, and capturing them for many years. And so he, he said that they called this the full take. and then the digital bearer instrument, digital cash, and that, that has, that, uh, you know, in a decentralized life, you need a place to, that you can be sure your, your money's kind of safe. So it, it's got to be a very secure uh, quantum resistant consensus algorithm that, that maintains the security of the network. Right after the stone revelations, I decided to come back into this space and really, you know, speed up <laughs> the privacy stuff, the mixing, because it was not capable of, of meeting the kind of performance requirements you have in, in uh, now because of, of the way chat works and what consumers expect. So that's when I found a way to, to speed it up dramatically by sort of, you know, even though there are thousands of papers based on my master's, that reference my master's, these people try to improve mixing and, and so on. No one found a way to speed it up, and I, I found a way to speed it up by a factor of 1,000. That's what CMix is, and that's what we've built at XX Network, and it's metadata shredding. So the, the who talks to who is shredded before it's even constituted, because each node has a, only a part of the information. It's like if you pass a deck of cards around a table and each participant shuffles the deck uh, randomly, completely random permutation, and pass it on to the next participant, uh, you know, even if one of those participants is honest, everyone else colludes, they still can't see the shuffle the that one honest participant made. So it's a, it's a, it's a way to complete, sort of destroy information about who's talking to who before that information even is 
constitute metadata shredding. Voting is a simple thing to do once you have the mixing. So um, I found myself like running my own fake company, if you will, a proprietary company that was allegedly selling voting equipment to election officials. And we exhibited at their major conferences and attended them and spoke at them and so on. And you know, they weren't interested in, a, in a, an election technology. That's why it was a fake company, because none of them would buy it. Because it, it basically took away their power. It made, it made it so that anyone in the public could check that the tally was computed correctly. They didn't have to trust the election officials. It was a public, the first publicly verifiable election technology for polling places. But anyone in the world could audit the, the vote that was done at, at, at a set of polling places. These are fundamentally important, interesting ideas that I have about how to decentralize power in the digital world. That's what I've been working on. Well, you know, I'm going to come in here to the blockchain space and help straighten it out and, and make something that really works and, and does solve the real problems and kind of repeat what I had done at Digicash, actually make something real that would make the world a better place. We have created a payments and consensus system that really does meet the challenge that could easily scale to consumer scale and that is quantum resistant. It's, it, it's not the kind of, you know, most of the stuff that's out there is based on government proposed codes. Well, just like they were spying on us, they were also paying people to put trap doors in key generation algorithms. That's public. The RSA company took $10 million from NSA to put a trapdoor in. This is in the literature. You can, they, they own Crypto AG in Switzerland, which sold cryptographic equipment to most countries around the world. Uh, I, I knew that company on the visit. They, they bought some of my technology once. And, uh, you know, uh, for decades, the CIA was controlling that company and another company in Switzerland, it turns out now, too, and so forth, which I also knew. And... Uh, they made the encryption for the SWIFT network. So it's the whole thing uh, is just, uh, um, you know, if you think that you can make a blockchain that's secure against national adversaries by using the kind of codes that they say you should use when they don't use them themselves to protect their own secrets, and your performance is not really up to consumer scale, and you keep saying it will be, you know, and all this. I mean, this is not a credible threat. This is a joke. So it's unfortunate. It's sad. At XX Network, we've, we've overcome these, these barriers, and we have, you know, I've seen running on my own laptop and 100 other, 150 other computers, uh, you know, many thousands of transactions per second, quantum secure payments, and, and a consensus that's quantum secure. So that you can't just take this down. Just very recently sat in on a, uh, with a bunch of uh, my engineers at the XX Network and watched the release of our, our, our beta for, for the high-speed private messaging that we've developed, which is you know, a huge breakthrough based on the CMIX technology. So it's arguably a thousand times faster in real time than other messaging systems. It's really large uh, anonymity sets, which is the figure of merit in privacy, how, how many people you're hidden among. And uh, it's, it, and it's pretty sophisticated technology, and we've, it's, it's up and running. Voting is too important to be left to government. So now I've created this initiative called the Seventh Estate. If you're interested, please check it out. And we're, you know, we're inviting people. If you apply, we may invite you to participate in our project. But that's a very cool thing. But it, it's a part of what I've, I call sample voting, which is my reaction to the fact that that 
the election technology that's used today is really inappropriate for the scale and the complexity of society today. And similarly, it's probably even inappropriate for blockchain. And so we are pushing at XX Network forward the sample voting technology, which it's already been proven in binding election for the Council of Europe and so on in the RS Voting Project. And you can read about that online if you like and read the white paper there, get the basic idea. But so that's the, the, the third piece. So how does this relate to you? I'm doing this, I've done this all for you, in fact, to make it possible for you to live a decentralized life, to decentralize power in the digital sphere to the extent that you can go about living in a, in a decentralized world. You need metadata shredding of communication, so, so keep confidential who communicates with who. You need digital cash that can't be taken down, so it can also be a secure store of value. And you need a kind of governance that scales with the complexity and size of the things, and the, the electorate and the issue space. Going from the days in Berkeley where I envisioned how important information technology and cryptography would be because it provides the only way to, to enforce things in, in the, digital, the upcoming digital world and the significance of metadata shredding and voting and, and the fact that then you would need money that could also work in that, in that space. You know, I realized all that. That's why I risked my life to set cryptography free and now I, we, I'm actually able to build the technology that instantiates all this and, and we'll make it available to, uh, to the public. And so I'm extremely enthusiastic about what we're doing at XX Network and I'd like to invite you all to uh, check it out and, 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 and join us.